Let's pray. We give you praise, O Lord, our Lord and Savior, our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, who is our one foundation, personally, but also communally, individually, and also as the church that you have called to be your bride. Lord, teach us who we are in you. You have made us as individuals in your Trinitarian image, and you create your church to be as a community of love and faith and purity. You create us to represent you as well, to be the contemporary, the modern-day manifestation of Jesus Christ on earth. Teach us who we are, and so enlighten us on our duty here in this world and in this life, and teach us what we are to be and to do while we await the coming and the consummation of our Lord Jesus Christ and His reign over all the earth. This we pray through His name. Amen. All right. So, just uh, as we have been talking in this whole series about what it means to talk about the foundations of the ancient faith, we're talking about what we believe and also why we believe it, and also how we got to, how we got here, right? The whole journey of development. We've been seeing in the last few weeks, really, that what began in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, and then progressing through the New Testament and the early church, beginning with some of the first, second, third century Christians who were, f- were reflecting on Scripture and bringing it into a concise, memorable form for people to understand and to absorb. And then it goes on to the restoration movement. We talk about Barton Stone and Alexander Campbell and how, and how they... Did my mic go off for a second? It felt softer. Okay. If y'all can hear me, that's fine. That's all right. So, and we talk about the restoration movement, how we come to really believe in what we believe in the way that we believe it, right? So, the church and of all the so-called things that, of all the different doctrines and matters that the churches of Christ are most interested in, the Bible is one. The church is the second. We have traditionally read scripture as a way of discovering, oh, this is you know, God's blueprint for the church. This is how God has designed his people to be. For since the beginning of Genesis all the way to present day, or even to the end of the book of Revelation, it's all about this is what God's community on earth is supposed to look like. And I think there's much to affirm and value in that. So that's why today we're talking about the church. I want to name at the start here that the word church often tends to be quite a loaded word. Both to Christians and non-Christians, it has some connotations, some of which are less helpful than others, right? If we're Christians, we think of church as it's the thing that we do on Sunday. It's where we show up. It's where we are with our Christian brothers and sisters. But for some people, church can mean the boring thing the stuffy rites and the rituals, the rote way of doing things, the institution, the non-personal nature of things. Sometimes that's what church means to people. And to people outside the church, people who look in at us and they think, oh, you know, those church people, they're so hypocritical, they're, they're, they're so arrogant and so forth. And so there's some unhealthy connotations about the word church. And today we want to kind of push back on those things and say, no, church was never meant to be that when God conceived of his community, the kind of people that he wanted to, into whom he wants to place his image on earth, he has a much better design and plan for these people. So what's interesting is that the word church was not used by Jesus all that much. The word that he likes to use, uh, Jesus uses the word church only twice in the New Testament. The word that he uses more often is kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, right? Right? when he invites people into his community. He doesn't invite them to join his church. He invites them into the kingdom. So that being said, everything that he says about the kingdom can be related to what we today call the church. And one of the two places that Jesus talks about the church is one of the most important ones, Matthew 6, 18, where 
after the Apostle Peter makes the good confession, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus responds, you know, blessed are you, right? And then he says, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And it's a, it's a clear indication that Jesus intends for a community that will be built upon the good confession, that he is the Christ, the son of the living God, against which even the gates of hell shall not prevail. That's quite a strong statement about the importance and the power of this church thing, right? So we want to go into talking about what does it mean? What does it look like? And how do we compare to the witness of Scripture and the Christian tradition? So, as we go through today, I'm going to share with you the discussion question we're going to have at the very end, right? Complete the sentence. I believe the church is, right? This was a common practice, especially in the early centuries, first to fifth century, where people were trying to articulate, what do we believe about this? So, and if you look at the way the ancient Christian creeds were formulated, they all go in this form. I believe X, Y, Z. So I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, so on and so forth. So at the end of today's class, when we get to our discussion, we will want to complete this sentence. I believe the church is, and then hopefully something that you hear today will be meaningful. All right? So... We begin with the church before there was a church. How exciting, right? Um, the idea that God creates a community, that he would call his own people, it begins in the Old Testament. The idea of church begins in the Old Testament in this way, right? In creation in Genesis, God pours his image into a community of human beings. He creates Adam and then says, it is not good for man to be alone, for man to reflect the image of God. Mankind must be in community. Mankind cannot be isolated and alone, right? So, it begins in creation. And then you progress through Genesis and you, we encounter Noah, we encounter Abraham, people who are very important characters, but God, but Yahweh always chooses their families. He says to Abraham, through you and your descendants, all nations will be blessed. I will make you the father of many nations. God's blessing is never restricted to the individual. It is always for the community, right? And then we get to Israel in Exodus 19. So this is before the Ten Commandments. This is before Sinai. This is after they have just crossed the Red Sea, right? And then this is what God says to them. Kind of their, uh, the first, one of the first big moments where God names them as his people directly. Now, therefore, if you indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant... You shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. If some of this verse seems familiar, we're going to come to that. But keep that tucked away, right? This is the real beginning of the idea that among all the peoples of the earth, there's going to be one nation, one community that will represent God more than all the other peoples. And they have a responsibility then not to keep and hoard all the blessing for themselves, but to share it with other people. So this verse emphasizes certain things about this particular community that will become God's people, right? It says, first of all, Israel's allegiance is to Yahweh alone, right? He says, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, right? By the way, covenant is something we might see later on this morning during the worship service. But Israel's allegiance is to Yahweh alone. You will have no other gods before me, right? First thing. Second, Israel's identity is distinct from the world. God says that they will be my treasured possession among all peoples. There's something unique about them, something distinct about them. And in the rest of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the rest of the Torah, we will see how their identity is supposed to be distinct. And then Israel's purpose is to bless the world. Kingdom of priests and holy nation carries this idea that you're not just meant to be you know, holy and you know, kept to yourself. We are set apart. Israel is set apart so that through them, the world can be blessed, just as was promised to Abraham 
through you and your descendants, all nations will be blessed. So that's the church before church in a way. This was what Israel was designed to be. Now, remember how we talked about this verse in Exodus, the, the language of treasure, possession, kingdom of priests, and holy nation. There is another place in Scripture, in the New Testament, where this language is repeated. And for all of us who are very good Bible students, you already know where that is. It is in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. <coughs> Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. What does Peter mean by recycling the language of Exodus? Did he just run off words? No, he, he didn't. He's using the same language as in Exodus when God speaks to Israel very deliberately. What Peter is saying to the church is that what was true of Israel when they were God's community is now true of the church with one big difference, Jesus Christ, who has expanded the definition of what it means to belong to Yahweh God, right? So if you think in terms of those same three categories, right, allegiance, identity, and purpose, Right? The new Israel's allegiance is to not just the God who rescued them through the Red Sea from the Egyptians, but to Jesus who calls them out of darkness into his marvelous light, who redeems them out of slavery and bondage to sin and into eternal life. Right? Their allegiance is to him. The second thing, their identity is also distinct from the world's darkness. He has transferred us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of of light, right? There's, there's a change. There's a distinctiveness. They're different from the world. And their purpose is to proclaim Jesus who redeemed them, right? It does not say, uh, you are chosen race, da, 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 a people for his own possession, so that you can keep them all to yourself. No, it's so that you can proclaim the excellencies of him to all the rest of the world, Right? Allegiance, identity, and purpose. What was true of Israel is now true for the church, right? So, progress a few more centuries, right? When the early church is trying to figure out who are we exactly, right? This is about 400 years after the first century and the, the Council of Nicaea that we've talked about several times, right? These Christian leaders are coming together and this is the year 381, so an important date for, for Christians in general. And as they are reflecting on the story of God's people, as they're reflecting on the story of Scripture, they want to put in simple and memorable terms what this community is supposed to look like. Because my words, allegiance, identity, and purpose can be quite chim, huh? right? So them being very educated, but also realizing we need to be able to tell the average person what church is all about, what this Christian community is all about. So this is what they came up with. They described the church as one, meaning it is united, as holy, right? That language is already in Scripture. It is distinct from the world. It is universal in the sense that it welcomes all people and it also elevates all people, right? In a back then when there were social classes everywhere and people were so divided and if you were of a certain class, you couldn't talk to the person of the next class, people would look down and look up and everything. In the church, in God's community, it's universal. Everyone is welcome and everyone is elevated to be equals. And it is apostolic. The teachings of Jesus as taught by the apostles. This references where, where we came from. It is not a community that just follows whatever rules it wants to follow. It follows the teachings of Jesus as taught by the apostles. So in the, in these, in the early creeds, it would string all these together. And the way that they would have answered my discussion question at the start was, I believe in the one holy, universal, and apostolic church. That was how they would put it, right? And all of that, is, is really a mirror to these categories of allegiance, identity, and purpose. 
Oneness, we are all in allegiance to the same Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, holiness, our identity being distinct from the world around us. Uh, apostolic, our mission is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? And uh, universal, the idea of royal priesthood. We are all royal priests, even though we may not be Levites by birth and so forth, right? Okay, so this is all that's happening in the early, you know, since Genesis to the early centuries of the church. Before we go on to the restoration movement part, I do want to make a couple of observations at this point. The first is that God's community is defined not by what they do, but who they belong to. They're not defined by, oh, the church is the group that meets on Sunday morning. They're not defined as, oh, the church is the group that, uh, that sings hymns only or choruses only. It is not defined as, oh, it's, it's, it's the, whoops, did I click something? It's not defined as, you know, the church that has this benevolence ministry or does that thing. They're always defined by, this is the church that belongs to Jesus Christ. This is the community that belongs and has allegiance to the God Yahweh who has redeemed us, who has saved us from the bondage and slavery, right? So it might be interesting to think about what do we as PPCOC, how do we define ourselves? Are we just the church that meets at 3 4, that will eventually meet at 347 Pasir Panjang Road? Or is there something more important to our identity as a church? Who do we belong to, right? So that's a question to think about. The other observation I wanted to make at this point is that God's community is defined less as place, it is almost never defined as event, but always as the people. And I mentioned these things in, um, in light of our new building. Of course, that's something we've been so excited to receive. And place is, was important for the Jewish people especially. They, were, they had their identity centered around the temple of Jerusalem. Like, this place was important for them, Right? Of course, that was thrown into confusion when the temple was destroyed and suddenly, oh, who are we as God's people if we don't have a temple, right? So, place becomes less important in defining the people. So, what does that say to us who stake our identity on what well, a church that meets at this place, in this new building? Um, church is also never defined as event, right? We often use language that, oh, I'm going to church on Sunday. I'm going to this gathering that happens from 9.30 to about 12, 12, 15. But Scripture doesn't define church as an event, like a Sunday morning event. Church is always defined as the people, the people who gather, who share this identity, who share this oneness and holiness and universe, universality and apostolicity who share all those things in common. It's the people who share that, right? So, just a thought. When we talk about, so this is sidetracking a bit from the church and its history. When we talk about being excited for a new building, which I think we should be, it's a big project that many of us have invested a lot in, financially and otherwise, right? What if we could expand our language to say, I'm so excited for what God is going to do through it, right? We put the building in its high place, but also in its proper place. It is a tool. It is a means. It is the instrument, a sacred instrument through which God can work. But we put the focus on God who's working. What if we were to say, we're so excited for how God is going to transform us in this new season marked by this new building, this new resource. What if we use that sort of language? Then we reduce the focus on the physical building and we increase the awareness that the church is the people, right? Who use this space to the glory of God. Just to float those thoughts. All right, so now we get to returning to the history part of it. We've talked about the Hebrew Bible, the New Testament, and now, and some of the early church, now we're in the restoration movement. Bart and Alex, my good friends, we're jumping about 1,300 years by the time we get to these guys. But a lot happens in the years leading up to it, right? We have, uh, we have many different Christian traditions that spring up and contribute to what it means to be the church. And if we look at the history, 
while we may not agree with every single traditions doctrine, there's stuff or there's things inside that may be useful, right? Um, some of it was helpful, others were not. Uh, there were some things that were happening in the 17, 1800s that were problematic. For example, the Enlightenment was happening. And Christianity was losing its primacy as the cultural worldview of the world. People are starting to disregard Christianity. It's old, it's outdated. Uh, it's better to use reason and the enlightenment and all those ideas. Um, so what did the church do? The church tried to harden themselves. They said, okay, we need, to pro- we, need to, we need to protect and ground ourselves in our doctrine. We need to solidify it so that no one can attack it. Of course, the problem when you try and do that is that then when you start drawing lines and everybody starts drawing their lines in different places, then that's where the church becomes divided. That's where the idea of denominationalism really begins, right? When everyone's drawing their own lines and saying, because I draw my line here and you draw your line here, we cannot associate. And that was a problem. There was also this new world independence because people were moving from Europe to the Americas and they were leaving their state churches behind. They were setting up their own. Uh, They wanted to practice their Christian faith in the way they wanted to, which also meant that, again, then when someone in this little town and someone in this other little town creates their own church and they don't really have a standard to follow, they just do their own thing and then they meet and then, eh, how come your church does that so differently? How come your church doesn't believe in Jesus as the Son of God? So on and so forth. And there were all these things that were happening in the background to Bart and Alex. So what did they do? So they come on board. Last week, if you remember, we talked about the Bible, how we decided, how the Restoration founders decided that, not not this decided, but they realized Scripture has always been here. Scripture has always been our uniting feature. So let's let the Bible speak and inform who we are meant to be, right? And so there came about some descriptions of what it means to be the church, right? So, and this is in keeping with what we saw in the Nicene Creed as well, right? Um, oneness. Restorationists would say, we're just Christians. Because there was a time where, oh, are you Presbyterian? Are you Methodist? Are you Baptist? Are you Anabaptist? Are you Puritan? Are you Catholic? Are you uh, Anglican? So on and so forth. Bart and Alex were very comfortable with saying, we're just Christians. We all believe in one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. We're just Christians. There's no label to us. We're just Christians, right? Holiness, this idea of being distinct from the world, was a very um, important idea for for these guys. Um, Of course, coming out of a place where every European uh, country had its own state church, uh, Bart and Alex were basically, no, even beyond that, we are focused not just on being born into the church. We want to be actively disciples. We want to choose Jesus for ourselves and we will be distinct from the world around us in that way. Universal, priesthood of all believers. Of course, coming from a context where you had ordained priests who could do things that the average lay person could not, the restoration movement was about emphasizing universality. We are all priests in God's kingdom. We all have the privilege of serving in God's kingdom, of course, in different ways according to our giftings, but there shouldn't be one who is above the other in a spiritual way, right? The universal part. And apostolic, no creed but the blueprint of the Bible, right? In the, all the confusion of all these different groups, the Methodists on this side, the, uh, the Anglicans on that side, the Presbyterians here, and Anabaptists on that side, let's drop all those things, right? No creed but what Scripture says we are. We are informed not by these, remember, during the Enlightenment, there were all this hardening and drawing of lines. It's not about those things. Let's look at Scripture and let's let that decide who we are and who we are meant to be. These were some of the, these are some of the words, the phrases that are very frequently used in Churches of Christ ever since the 1700s, 1800s. And we get to be recipients of this heritage, of this view of what it means to be the church. So, what does it mean for today then? 
our oneness means that we are united in our diversity, right? We are all gifted differently. We all come from, uh, we come from a variety of backgrounds, and that's good. But we are one in spite of all of that. We are, as a church, we are holy. We live according to distinctive values from the world around us, especially in a society like Singapore where it's very secular, right? Uh, generally, it's, there are good morals practice, but even then, we as God's church live with distinct values even above and beyond that, right? Okay. Universal, we all have an important part to play. Some of us may be gifted with being on stage and serving in this capacity. Others of us, and perhaps even more importantly, are gifted in serving God in teaching a GEMS class, in being a Christian in your particular workplace where no one else is present with the gospel and only you are there, right? We all have an important part to play. Apostolic, we measure everything we do by scripture, right? Right? We, we don't make decisions because, oh, will this decision get us more members? We don't make decisions by, oh, can we do this and, and then get like, more publicity in, in news media? Our, the way we measure is not by numbers. It's not, by, it's not even by number of baptisms and conversions. The way we measure what we do is according to Scripture. And what does it say? It's the story that we talked about last week. It's the story of what God is doing in the world. And in what we do, are we being the presence of God living in the world? Before we go into our discussion questions, there's one more idea that has come up so frequently that I think it's worth addressing in a conversation about church. Anyone here heard something akin to this? Anyone heard or been exposed to any, an idea that's something like this? I love Jesus, but not the church. Somewhat familiar? Somewhat? Okay. Maybe not so much. Um, I see some hands. I see one enthusiastic hand in the back there. Thank you. Uh, who's behind Avin? Uh, okay. <laughs> right. And this, I think, is common among young people, right? My generation and a bit above me and definitely below me. Uh, and so, really, I'm speaking to people who are not in this room uh, and for our information as well. There's a growing number of people in the world who think that you know, I like Jesus. I like his, I like the Sermon on the Mount. I like that he came to earth, died, was buried and was resurrected and saves me from my sins. But I don't like being with people who also believe the same thing. And the reason is many. There's many reasons, right? Some people say this because they like Jesus and his values, but they don't see Christians living it out. That's, that's, some, of, that's some of it. Some people do love Jesus. They love the study part. They love growing in knowledge and faith but they realize that, wow, when I go into a church, nobody is at my level, right? Like, I'm, I'm so much better than them and I can't grow in maturity and understanding because these people are holding me back. Better that I be alone, right? On my own, I can watch five sermons on Sundays. If I go to church, I have to hear one and it may not be as good as these other ones. Um, by the way, this, after, this later this morning sermon, I think will be very meaningful, just saying. Okay, so, but there are these sentiments, right, that... Jesus is nice, but the community is not so nice. So what, how might we respond to that, right? My response is that we cannot be Jesus lovers, we cannot be Jesus followers if we are not with a community of Jesus followers. What did God say in Genesis 2? It is not good for men to be alone. It is not good for Christians to be isolated and on their own thinking that I can grow myself and feed myself and nourish myself. Last week, our conversation about Scripture, I think we all ag realized, agreed that I can't understand all of Scripture on my own. I need people to be around me and to challenge me and to converse with me and to differ with me so that we can grow together, right? I shared that story last week about how our youth ministry, we gather and we have questions about Scripture that we sometimes don't reach an answer to. But that is probably the most real expression of church, when we come together, when we are trying to follow Jesus together, and when we encourage and sharpen one another, because we are grounded in our unity, we are grounded in our mutual holiness, that we're all learning to live this distinct lifestyle from the world, 
we're all, we are all learning. So just because I might be youth minister doesn't mean they don't have anything to teach me. We learn from each other. And we are apostolic because it's not just, oh, John says this, so it must be correct, right? It is, what does Scripture say? Let's be informed and challenged by that. That's what church means. And if we're not doing that, if we're not being in a community where we can do that, then you might know a lot about Jesus, but we might not, that's not really loving Him as it is. All right, uh, it's 10.05. Some discussion questions to just reflect on. I've spoken a lot of things this morning. So to help us process this, right? Um, discussion questions like the one we saw at the start. Complete this phrase in your own words. I believe that the church is so on and so forth. Um, I see a lot of people took notes and that's great. So you can use those to fill out your answer. Second question, if you do have uh, some time, right? What are practical ways that we can live out the biblical call to be one holy, universal, apostolic church? All right. Time is 10.05. We'll come back at 10.23 so that we can have a few voices sharing after that, okay? So that's just about... Uh, I, I can't do the math. Uh, 17 minutes, okay. I believe that the church is and what practical ways can we live the biblical call to be one holy, universal, apostolic church? 